Hey guys, I hope you're having a nice weekend. Today you are going to be watching the lecture video and taking notes on your notes organizer on biochemistry, which is of course the chemistry of life. So before we can start talking about how chemistry applies to living things, we first have to know what chemistry is. So chemistry is the study of the composition, structure, and properties of matter. Okay, well what is matter? Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. You probably have heard that definition a time or two by now. So why in the world are we talking about chemistry in a class like biology? How does chemistry relate to biology? Well, all living things are made up of what? matter. So in order to understand how living things um, are structure and function wise, we have to understand the chemistry, the very basics at the atomic level. So atoms are the building blocks of matter. You've probably seen this type of picture before. This is your sort of traditional picture of an atom. Um, at the nucleus of an atom, there are particles called protons and neutrons, and all of these particles that make up an atom have different charges. So protons are positively charged, neutrons are just like they sound, neutral, and electrons have a negative charge. So they are ele electrons are negatively charged particles. So in the nucleus of the atom, we have protons and neutrons. Floating around around the outside of the nucleus, you have the electron. So you should have just filled in one, two, three, and four on your notes organizer. You can also draw, use this picture as a guide for number five on your notes organizer. You can draw this um, carbon atom that I have here. Okay, so an atom is what makes up an element, and you've probably heard of the periodic table of elements before. You probably spent a lot of time in the eighth grade learning about the different elements. An element is a pure substance that cannot be broken down. There are over 100 known elements, and I think about 90, um, one or two occur naturally. Um, each element has a unique name and symbol, and that is what you see when you are looking at the periodic table of elements. You're seeing the element's name, the symbol, the atomic weight, the atomic or the atomic mass, the atomic number. And a periodic table is organized in a very specific way. This is number seven on your notes organizer. The periodic table is organized by the number of protons that is found in the atom of that element. So because you organize the periodic table by the number of protons, this is called the uh, atomic number, you also are organizing it by properties. Um, all of your metals are going to end up together, all of your metalloids are going to end up together, all of your nonmetals are going to end up together. So that is because they are organized by the number of protons that they have in the atom's nucleus. We call the vertical columns of a periodic table groups. We call the horizontal rows of the periodic table periods. So you will probably hear me refer to those several times. Okay, so like I mentioned in the slide before, the atomic number of an element on the periodic table shows you the number of protons in that element or atom. Okay, so the number of protons, that is the atomic number. And in a neutral atom, think about it, if, if you have 10 protons, if the atom overall is neutral, which is all the atoms listed on the periodic table of elements and everything we're going to talk about in biology class, we'll be, talk we'll be dealing with neutral atoms. If you have a neutral atom that has 10 protons, to make it neutral, you have to have the same number of electrons because protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. So in a neutral atom, if the atomic number is 47, that tells you the number of protons, but it also tells you the number of electrons. The atomic mass is found down at the bottom of the grid on the periodic table. So all of these are atomic masses of boron, carbon, and nitrogen. And the atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons in the nucleus of an element. Electrons basically have no mass. Um, they're, they're sort of thought of almost just like little energy particles. They really have no weight to them, but protons and neutrons do. So they make up the mass of the element or atom itself. Okay, so you find this down at the bottom here. So then, if this is the number of protons, and this is the number of protons plus neutrons, how can we find just the neutrons? Well, you take this number, the atomic mass, and you subtract from it this number, 
the atomic number or the number of protons. So you take the protons plus neutrons, in this case 11, and you subtract 5 from that, and that gives you the number of neutrons. So how many neutrons do you have in a boron atom? You have 6 neutrons. Now, if the atomic mass of carbon is 12, and the atomic number or number of protons is 6, how many neutrons do you have in carbon? You have 6. Now let's see if you can figure out the number of neutrons in a nitrogen atom. Right, you're going to have seven. Good job. So we've talked about single atoms, but atoms rarely exist just by themselves. They want to bond with other substances. So a chemical bond holds atoms, molecules, and compounds together. There are two types of chemical bonds. They are either covalent or they are ionic. And the difference is what's happening with the electrons in the different atoms. So if the electrons are being shared evenly, that is called a covalent bond. If the electrons are being given to the stronger atom, and that deals with electronegativity, which we're not going to talk about, but if the electrons are being given, then that is an ionic bond. So water molecule, a water molecule, for example, we have our um, two hydrogens and our oxygen atom here. They are sharing these little electrons here. So this would be an example of a covalent bond. Okay, so you should have just filled in numbers 8, 9, 10, and 11 and 12 on your notes organizer. We should be moving to number 13. Okay, so we have um, atoms that are chemically bonded together. When you have two or more atoms joining together, that is called a molecule. When that molecule contains at least two different elements that is called a compound. So let me say that again. A molecule is when you have two or more atoms joined together. Those can be the same atoms, the same type of atoms, those could be different atoms, but that is called a molecule. A compound is a type of molecule, but you have to have at least two different elements. And remember the elements are like the letters represented on the periodic table. So look at this diatomic molecule here called, um, this is just atmospheric oxygen. Oxygen in the atmosphere always exists as two atoms chemically bonded together. So there are two atoms, so that fits our definition of a molecule, but does it fit our definition of compound? No, that does not fit our definition of compound because we're only dealing with one element. So that is why this statement is true. All compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. Atmospheric oxygen is a great example of that. So let's look at, at water here, H2O. How many atoms do we have joined together? Total, we have three atoms joined together, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So that definitely fits our definition of a molecule, right? Does this fit our definition of a compound? Does H2O fit our definition of a compound? Do you have at least two elements here? Yes, absolutely. You have hydrogen and you have oxygen. So that would be both a molecule and a compound. Same thing for sodium chloride. It would be a molecule, but it would also be a compound. What about atmospheric nitrogen? What would that be? That would be only a molecule. Two atoms joined together, but they're two nitrogen atoms, the same type. So it would only be a molecule, not a compound. See if you can figure out the rest. Okay, you should have answered number 13 on your notes organizer. Um, you should have answered number 14, and you can use that list here to give you some examples of items that are just molecules and not compounds. Okay, we can't talk about chemistry without talking about reactions. Um, and there are two different types of reactions. You have physical reactions and you have chemical reactions. A physical reaction is where you do not have a new substance being formed. You only have a change in the state of matter. So our typical go-to example is going to be the melting of an ice cube. That is a physical reaction. It's still water. It's just going from a solid state to a liquid state. So it's a, a change in the state of matter, not a change in the substance itself. We're going to be mostly talking about chemical reactions, where you actually have the reorganization of atoms or groups of atoms into totally different substances. So the oxidation that occurs in rusting, that is an example of a chemical reaction. Combustion or burning, like the lighting of a match, that's a chemical reaction. And then cooking an egg, that's going to be a chemical reaction too. Sort of a cheat way to, 
to remember physical versus chemical reactions is you can sort of put together, put back together something that goes through a physical reaction. So if you crush a can, you can sort of uncrush it, right? Or if you melt an ice cube, you can refreeze it. That's sometimes a little cheat way of remembering, determining if something is a physical or chemical reaction. Okay, now we show chemical reactions taking place in a very specific way, and that is through the use of chemical equations. So chemical equations describe the substances in the reaction, and arrows indicate the process of the change. You are always going to have the items reacting on the left side of a chemical equation, and you're going to have the items being produced on the right side of the equation. So you have the reactants on the left, they're reacting, in order to produce something. Those are the products on the right side of the equation. So here's an example of a chemical equation. Carbon dioxide and water react to form glucose and oxygen. So first of all, let's see if you can figure out what biochemical process does this chemical equation represent. Here are your hints. Glucose is being produced, a sugar is being produced, and oxygen is being produced. What process do you know that produces glucose and oxygen? That would be photosynthesis. So on your notes organizer, number 16, that's the process of photosynthesis. And I want you to circle and label the reactants, which are on the what side of the equation? Left side of the equation. And then circle and label the products here on the right side of the equation. Now, all chemical reactions either take in or release energy during the process. We can illustrate that through the use of what's called an energy diagram. So they illustrate the energy being used or produced in a reaction. If the reaction is releasing energy, that is called exothermic. Think about that. Energy is exiting the reaction. It's exothermic. If the reaction is taking in heat energy, that is endothermic. Okay, so exothermic releases heat energy, endothermic absorbs heat energy. Now, the amount of energy that is needed for the reaction to take place, that is called the activation energy. Now, that's going to happen whether energy is being released or absorbed. You're going to have to have uh, some minimum amount of energy needed for the reaction to take place. But if overall you are releasing heat energy, that's an exothermic reaction, and an endothermic you are absorbing heat energy. So let's look at this energy diagram. Here on our y-axis, we have the amount of energy, right? Here's the amount of energy available to the reactants. Here's the amount of energy available for the products. So obviously, we have less energy here at the products than what we started with. So that means that energy must have been released. So this, if energy is released, that is what type of reaction? That is an exothermic reaction. Energy is, is uh, exiting the reaction, exothermic. The energy of the product is lower than the energy of the reactants. This type of reaction will actually feel hot. Like if you were to perform this reaction in a test tube, the test tube would feel hot because that energy is being released. Here's the energy diagram for an endothermic reaction. So remember, endothermic, you have heat energy being absorbed. So here's the energy level of the reactants. And here's the energy level of the products. So you can see that the products have more energy available. So what you ended up with have, has more energy than what you started with. That means you must have absorbed heat energy. So the energy of the products is higher than the energy of the reactants. And this reaction would be just the opposite. It would feel cold if you did it in a test tube. So you should be pausing, maybe going back in order to draw the energy diagrams for exothermic and endothermic reactions. Okay, I'm going to end by talking about enzymes, um, which are special catalysts to help speed up biological reactions taking place in, in living, living things. So enzymes are special proteins that help to speed up chemical reactions and lessen activation energy. So look at this energy diagram here. It's taking less energy for the reaction to take place, and the reaction taking place with the enzyme is taking less time. So they speed up the reaction and they lower the activation energy needed for the reaction to take place. It does not increase how much product is being made and it does not get used up in the reaction. This is why they are so useful in living organisms. Okay, I'm going to scroll through the next three slides so that you can get the information for your notes, but I'm not going to talk about them just yet because I want to give you the definition of enzymes and that's it. So you might need to pause on these next couple of slides to get this information.